um, today is basically a closer look. So Shanita was great because she gave a really good overview of some of the support services, obviously within the university, um, but also you know um, some points points of action. So if you know someone who's got a mental health issue or someone who is basically demonstrating some behaviours that you think are a little bit odd, but that oddness is impacting on their daily functioning. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it down just a notch closer, so just give you a closer snapshot as to what the most common disorders look like. They're called high prevalence disorder, and they are anxiety and depression okay, that have been very briefly referred to. And, and so um, hopefully not to make you more fearful as you, you might connect. What happens is as I give you some information, you might go, oh my God, that sounds like me. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean you have a disorder. Okay. So, in fact, you know, there's a thing. Anyone studying psychology here? Okay. So the DSM five um, is like a little booklet. It's bigger. There's a bigger version. Um, but it has a group of um, all the disorders that you basically that are up to date. You know, that you could imagine, and they define what makes up a disorder. And if I gave this to each and every one of you you could find yourself in here, not having a disorder, but demonstrating a symptom, okay? And that's what we're gonna to go to now, because I don't want you to freak out going, oh my God, I've got two of those symptoms, I must have a disorder, okay? It, it just means that you're human, and that every single human has a range of emotions. And sometimes we sit in the negative ones for too long. And if we do, that can cause an impact on our functioning, okay? And that's what we'll look at. Okay? And it doesn't make you crazy. I told you, if anyone's familiar with this one, and know that your worldly goods and children are in fact a test for you. And there's many other verses that refer to lots of different types of tests. Okay. So they're, they're going to be there. So if you if you turn on the radio in the morning like I do, if you're heading into the city, okay, and you're like, where are those traffic jams? Is the road that I'm travelling, is there a traffic jam? Is there a delay? Okay. And you start to become aware and you're like, damn, there's, a, there's an accident on that road, I'm going to go around. Okay. We do that to prepare ahead, okay, to reduce the inconvenience that traffic jam might present us. So having some knowledge that there could be a traffic jam in our life, or a speed hump, or whatever you want to call it, hopefully will help you thinking, what do I need to have in my world now to help me to prepare for that when it happens, or if it happens? What do I need to think? Do I need better thinking? Do I need better supports? Do I need better quality relationships? Do I need to eat better? Do I need to stop smoking? Okay, so there's a whole lot of things. It basically gets us to think that around the corner there could be a test and we just need to think about how we modify our life now before that happens. So that if something happens, that it doesn't impact us significantly at a physical health level or even a psychological health level. So as I said before, as humans, we've been created to experience a range of emotions. That's what makes us human. Okay? So sometimes if we sit in some of those negative ones for too long, it can put, it, it put us at risk of developing certain things. Okay? Or in fact, what we say is if we sit, if we think certain things, it influences some of those feelings that we might and we might sit there for too long. So I want you to start to view that having a mental health issue isn't so far removed from any of us. Okay? We do mental health every single day. Every breath you're doing mental health. Hopefully health and not so much illness. Okay? We do it. So it's not so far removed. But when you start to notice that some of your friends or family members are sitting in one of those negative emotions for too long, okay? then we have to start to allow us to go, wow. And what we usually do is what we've been taught to do, and that's to care. Okay? And hopefully, if we see someone on campus, or even with our family members, it's to maybe give them some advice, okay? some nasita. Okay? And that advice could look like different things. And if you find, hang on a minute, that advice isn't working, or they're not taking up my advice, or it's not even having any impact on their feeling state at all, then maybe you need to consider that the advice is not enough, and maybe they need a more specialised type of support. No one likes to think there's something wrong with them. 
We're not programmed that way. No one likes it. So of course, your friends aren't going to rush to see the psych. They're not going to run. Okay. Sometimes they don't run to see a doctor either. Because okay. it's like, it's fine. I'm all good. There's nothing wrong with me. And that's fine. But if it starts to impact on their daily functioning where they're not coming to university or they're getting an assignment too late or they can't get out of bed or they're not sleeping at all um, or they can't focus on any one thing or, or they're exhibiting behaviours that are even more concerning like self-harm okay. um, or you know, a whole range of other disorders but I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Okay. Any questions at this point? You see how if you sit in a state of loneliness for too long, feeling really empty and feeling like there's no one in your world, what that might, how might, how might that impact you? But we're not designed to sit in any of them. In fact, we're not always meant to be happy. Some people will try and think, well, I have to aim for the positive ones and sit there all the time. And if I'm not sitting there all the time, gee, there must be something wrong. That's not the truth either. What's the one on the yellow icon? Anxious. Okay. Anxious. Yeah. So we're going to have a closer look at anxiety, <laughs> speaking of that, because it is one of the most common warning for. Okay. So who's ever been worried about anything? Anyone? <laughs> worried about anything at all? Yeah. You're going to get your results in this one few weeks or something. Anyone worried about that? Anyone worried about getting a car parking fine today? <laughs> yeah. I am, I'm not out of here in 50 minutes, all right, guys. <laughs> so that worry is normal. Okay. okay. It gives us this very normal response. The response is there, God give it to keep us alive. That's it. It's a survival mechanism. And it can throw us into four states. Okay? Freeze, literally, like ice. Freeze, stay still, stop, don't think, don't move, don't do anything, stay still. Okay. So imagine there's a tiger coming in the room right now and it starts to look at me. And initially I might freeze, hoping the tiger sees past me. Okay. And I might stay like that as the tiger starts to turn its head to you. Okay. You might freeze too, but I will run. I will run. Okay, so will, my body will go, even if I wanted to save you, my body will make me run. Okay, why? Self-preservation. I have to keep myself alive first. Okay. Or if it was coming too close to me, about this close, I might go, I'll go into a fight. Okay. I'll go into a fight. I will try and fight it. I won't win, but I will try. Okay. So that, that anxiety when we experience that is sometimes the dial on our anxiety can just be too high. So imagine that um, I'm worried about getting a parking fine, but my anxiety is so high that I freeze, I just basically stay here, jittering. So if the dial of anxiety is just too high for the situation, appropriate for the tiger, not appropriate for the parking fine. Okay? So the dial on something's anxiety can be too high and it throws out symptoms okay, that impairs their daily functioning. Other than that, anxiety is quite functional. As I said, it's here to keep you alive, it's here to keep you moving, to run away from something that's attacking you, okay? Defending yourself, getting you to think quickly, problem solving, okay? So essentially it's functional except where it becomes dysfunctional. As I said, that, that volume's up too high. <coughs> so what would it look like if the volume's up too high and it starts to impact on our feelings? Confusion, okay? My thoughts are running so fast I can't even hear them, I can't work them out, I can't problem solve them. Okay? I'm worried, not just a little bit of the time, but a lot of the time, and about anything, more than just a tiger. Okay? I'm worried about what my friends are thinking about. I'm worried about will I impress my parents with these results. I'm worried will I get a job at the end of this course. I'm worried about lots of things all the time. To the point that your body starts to fatigue or get under the body. Constantly nervous. Where do a lot of people feel nervousness? Their stomach. Ever gone into an exam or given a public talk? Start to feel sick. Yeah. Your mouth starts to dry out. Okay. So 
so, it's just a symptom of anxiety. It's chemicals in the system. Okay? I get people who come into my clinic and they feel not only tired but exhausted. Exhausted that their brains are working too hard. Okay? Irritable. So it doesn't just make people fatigued, it can actually cause you to feel irritable and actually angry. So sometimes the basis of an anger management problem can actually be anxiety. Okay? Actually, you guys, you and people, the guys in particular. Okay? Okay? You don't know what to do with this frustration, this energy that you're feeling from the anxiety. And actually, in, the, in my clinic, I see a lot of young guys, not girls, but not to say that it doesn't happen, but a lot of young guys medicating with cannabis. Okay? Medicating with cannabis. So they might start smoking at university or you know, just when they're even in high school. And they'll start doing that and they'll go, oh man, I feel relaxed now. That's what the effect of the drug is. But seriously, I feel relaxed. I don't have to worry so much anymore. And then they keep doing it because it works. So someone who might be, as you said, they might see you, some people who use cannabis actually are treating an anxiety disorder. They just don't know that they have it, as in the anxiety disorder. Um, and angry, as we know. High level of anger. How does it affect our body? We know 100% that we're connected, mind, body, we believe soul as well. Okay? So we're all connected. That's why when you do feel nervous about something that where there's some level of performance, like an exam, some people feel sick. Or you go to the toilet a thousand times. Okay? So it's affecting your body because of the chemicals being released in your body to get ready to run. Kids have that. Kids can have butterflies and stuff. Okay. Um, or if your breathing's really out of whack, dizziness. Okay. Um, because you're just not getting enough oxygen. Any questions? Has anyone had even just one of those what about symptoms? Panic attacks. Is that is there a, another sort of medicine other than cannabis? Because you mentioned about um, your uh, patients having to uh, smoke or they have to smoke cannabis. Oh okay. Let me just clarify that point. No. They're self medicating illegally. Okay? What they're doing, what I mean by that, is not that they're going to the doctor and they're being prescribed cannabis. That's not what I mean. Okay. They're just using it like they would a cigarette and they find that it helps to calm them down. But they don't realise they have an anxiety, an anxiety disorder underneath that. It just works and they keep doing it. So rather than going to the doctor and getting treated for an anxiety disorder, they think they've found a solution for them. And it just happens to be the form of marijuana. Make sense? Yeah. So there are many other non-medicating ways to control both panic attacks and also lots of other anxiety disorders. And very few people need medication, but it has its place. Okay. Anyone have any other questions about this? Um, the people who are sleeping. Yeah. You know how some people will say, "Oh, um, I'm having problems sleeping. I've got insomnia." Like, um, not insomnia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's between the two. Like, I, I do. I find it really, really difficult to sleep, and I do think a lot about all the things that I'm doing. is actually a completely different disorder but what happens is that in the there's a lot of um, symptoms that you might find so even in um, the disorder of depression you'll get one or two um, depressive symptoms in an anxiety disorder okay you'll also get some anxious symptoms in a depressive disorder and and they'll be as insomnia is one of the symptoms of some anxiety disorders as in to get a diagnosis insomnia needs to be one of them but you can have no anxiety but just can't sleep like generally during the day you function fine you're not worried all of the time which is clearly a signal that you have anxiety but you just can't sleep at night okay. it could be about watching too many screens too many ipads and you know needing more time to wind down or it could be you just have caffeine and caffeine's now having an effect on you okay. so there's, there's heaps of other reasons for insomnia as a Completely separate disorder. Okay, so I've broken this down to so that what I want you to do is not only to um, think about obviously being healthier, mentally healthier, but also is because um, as it was mentioned, very few people seek assistance when they um, when the assistance is there. Okay, and um, standing from you know where I stand, I know the treatments that are available. I know the treatments are really usually quite successful. 
okay, for a lot of anxiety patients, for a lot of um, people who experience depression from time to time, a lot of the treatments that psychologists um, offer are very effective. And then it frustrates, you know, to some extent, myself, where you get people not utilising something that's effective that could be helping them, but they're unaware. Okay? So whether this is um, for you or for a friend, um, then encourage friends to seek services too. And I know 100% that what is culture, what's relevant for many of you is finding someone where you feel like that your faith um, and or cultural beliefs won't be compromised. So I know psychologists have good, very good ethics, okay? but I know, having seen patients that come to me, or clients that come to me, um, that they do so. I have about a 60-40 split in my clinic. About 60 to 70% of my clients are Muslim, about 40 to 30% on any given week um, are not. But I know that the ones who are come to me because I'm Muslim, because they don't have to explain their Islam first and then the problem. They just need to explain the problem. And I will understand it in the context of their Islam or their cultural background. Okay? And that's really important. It's important that you find someone that you trust. So try and get a recommendation from someone. And they don't have to be Muslim side. But if that's what you want, try and get recommendations from people. Okay? Um, and sometimes you, sometimes you may not feel comfortable coming to a site on, on campus. But you know what? They might have a really good referral for you if you want to see someone off campus. Okay. Um, okay. So what does it look like if someone has some anxiety? And, and I'll go through, there's a lot of different anxiety disorders, and I'll go through that next. But I just want to talk to you about some of the common behaviours. So you don't want to go out. Okay. There could be something worrying that's outside and feel people are in their comfort zone when they're at home, so, and they would like to retreat. Um, don't want to talk to people as in about the problem, or sometimes it's just withdrawal altogether. Um, trouble sleeping, want to be by yourself, easily frightened, so, so someone just saying hi and you're, you've got this jumpy type response, like, oh my god, you know, if someone comes around the corner. Um, getting angry easily um, and yelling at people, but you feel nervous, but you're yelling at them, like almost like you could snap. Or you're walking through a shop and it's like, oh god, I hope no one talks to me because I'll just flip out. Like feel like you're not 100 percent in control of yourself. Thoughts? These are only very random examples, so please don't think, oh my god, I've had that thought, therefore I have an anxiety disorder. Okay, they are just common thoughts of some people who do. Um, so they'll think I'm boring. Okay? So there's a preoccupation with what other people think about you. They'll think I'm dumb. I can't stand these scary feelings. So there's an anxiety, we you just feel scared for no particular reason, but there's a I can't stand this. Um, I'm not as good as them, so comparisons between you, again, worried about what people think of you. Um, so there's a whole range, okay? Or did I do that properly? Let me go back and do it again. Okay? So this example, I see um, lots, of, lots of clients that have some religious things to their anxiety, and that might mean in their prayer they get through four records and they give their salams, and then they go, did I pray for a cup? They just three and control. It was two. Damn, I'll just do it again. And then you do it again. But you do it again about six times. Okay? And you just aren't sure whether you completed those four cards properly. Well, we'll do it. Did I do my elbow? Did all of my feet get weak? So there's a preoccupation with perfection around religious rituals. Okay? But it is so, but it's an inconvenience. And we know Islam is not meant to be an inconvenience. We're actually not even expected to achieve perfection. We just have to do our best. Okay? And it's a problem with the focus on perfection that then gets people to repeat those behaviours, but over and over again. So that it will do, that should take, you know, about a minute or thereabouts, well, maybe one to two minutes, is taking 10 and 15 and 20 minutes. Okay? which is excessive, and, in, and then that, that impairs functioning. Make sense? Okay, pauses. Okay. If someone comes to me and says, why do I have anxiety? Wow, I can give you a thousand reasons. There's a thousand reasons. Okay, but there's some common ones. Hereditary. 
lack of movement and exercise, too much cortisol building up in your system, and you start to feel agitated. Caffeine, sugar, excessive junk food consumption. Caffeine's a funny one. I had a guy with anxiety, and his anxiety between one session to the next skyrocketed, and he's like, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. And I'm like, oh wow. And then I'm thinking, wow. I think you need to go see your doctor and get an anti and anxiety medication because it's, your functioning has really become quite impaired. And then I just happened to check a question. Because I knew he liked coffee. And I said, how many coffees have you had in the last, you know, like yesterday? And it's like 20 double shots. <laughs> That'll probably explain it. It's cut down on the coffee. Just cut down on the coffee. So, and that's all it was. It was just that his caffeine intake was excessive and it was giving heart palpitations and shortness of breath and symptoms that mimicked an ex like a panic attack, but it wasn't that, it was just excessive caffeine that was interacting with the system. Um, a pressured lifestyle. So that can mean, God, most of us live pressured lifestyles these days. We've got to really watch that, okay? Our, our work-life balance, there's no such thing, but we can schedule in downtime, okay, scheduling, recreation, exercise, sleep, get to sleep, okay, um, try and keep a routine, routine helps me. Um, this is an interesting one and one that I pretty much see from all my clients, mum and dad or one of them is a warrior, so as a little kid they taught you a language around worry, okay, so for example if someone comes in you know, to my clinic, if they're a warrior, without even recognising, they will have surveyed you, all, and they will have quickly surveyed, without even realising, all the corners, all the potential dangers, all the small objects. Okay? But for myself, I might walk into a room and just sit down. Why? Because I don't pay attention to those things. I'm not on alert for danger. But you get taught that when you're a kid. Okay? And so if you've got a warrior who's a mum, or a warrior who's a dad, they taught you how to speak to a worry. Okay. And it goes into your brain. Okay. So you speak Arabic <laughs> and worry. So it primes you. Now that doesn't mean you're going to be disordered. Okay. It doesn't mean you're going to have an impairment because of the anxiety. It just means that you're going to be alert and perceptive to the possible dangers in the environment. Remember, you're only going to be disordered if it causes significant impairment in your daily functioning. You can't come to you. You can't get to work. Okay? You just feel so yuck, so bad, or whatever it might be, you're so anxious that you fatigue and so forth that it really is like being knocked out, you know, partially with a flu. Okay, if you're going to equate it. But that flu might go on for months. Okay? Four years. Okay. Experienced or saw something very scary or traumatic. Okay. And some communities have to pay attention more than this, and particularly if you arrive from overseas and, or, or you have family in port countries, or you have family right now on the other side of the world. You have to be mindful to protect yourself from traumatic experiences because they do have an impact. And this also goes for children. So, um, my husband used to say, he used to say, when I was little, I was like six, and I remember watching my parents let me watch The Exorcist. Okay? No censorship in the household, really. And I'm like, The Exorcist, you're like six years old. He goes, I was freaked out for years. You know? So sometimes seeing something that's scary at a time that you're really not prepared to see that, and this includes Facebook, okay? Scrolling down your images, and then, you know, you get all these, you know, dead, blown apart bodies. That is traumatic. Don't underestimate the impact of seeing images like that on your brain. Okay, it's traumatic. Okay, whether that results in <coughs> trauma, as in that it impacts on your functioning, is another thing. But be mindful around your conversations. And this also goes, unfortunately, if you have for vicarious trauma, not that you experienced it, but that you witnessed it or you heard it through, like you heard it firsthand. So hearing what relatives might be going through overseas right now, um, or or in the recent past, can have a traumatising impact on you. Okay, where you start worrying around your own mortality, or around what life means, or around someone in your family getting hurt. Okay, so just think about this. This is another form of anxiety. Any questions about that? Yep. Yeah. I was ready to run. <coughs> YouTube clip or you know 
even if you're scanning, if you see something, don't always stop at it. Keep it, let it go past or look away, but don't press play. Okay? Sometimes we can read about what's happening, that doesn't mean we need to see it. Okay? It doesn't we we need to respond empathically with what's going on overseas. Doesn't mean we have to see graphically what's going on. Okay? Respond empathically, as in have compassion for what's going on anywhere or with anyone, but doesn't mean you have to see the images yourself. Okay. In fact, let's take that example. If you haven't been able to sleep for the whole night, then you've actually it's reduced your capacity to respond empathically, as in feeling for them to do something because you're tired now. You see what I mean? So if we reduce our own ability to do anything because we're being exposed to graphic images, then that's not helping. Some people go, yeah, but I, I want to know what's going on. Great, read about it. Don't, just be mindful what you see. Okay? Just like the, the, say if I go to a DVD store and I want to get a movie, um, I hate horror. I can't stand it, okay? I actually feel tense if I watch it. So why would I pay for that experience? So I don't. I don't. Okay? So I'm more selective and I listen to my body. I listen to what my body tells me. Is this good for me or bad for me? What is my body sending out a symptom? If I feel tense, it ain't good for me. So be mindful and don't decrease your capacity to respond to anyone's crisis by just viewing anything and everything and not thinking it's not having an impact because it does have an impact, okay? particularly for children. Don't watch them like the exorcist you know, when they're six years old. Okay? <laughs> Are we scared? Okay, there we go. I know we've got a little bit more time and I haven't even covered depression because I talk too much. Okay. So these are different types of anxiety disorders. I won't go into heaps of detail. But as you can see, there's quite a lot. So it's not just like one thing. Having anxiety, um, if you're coming to a site, could mean a whole range of different things. Okay? Um, I mean, panic disorder, where people are having full-on panic attacks. And you know what? So many people think they have a panic attack and they don't. I'm just like, yep, give me another symptom. Oh, I just lost my breath. That's not a panic attack. Okay? Or, you know, or I felt like I was, you know, what the, like, um, I don't know, I felt, yeah, like, the common, the most common one is I couldn't catch my breath, etc. Um, usually people will have, I know they've had a panic attack if they're from the ambulance and they end up in hospital because they think that they're dying or having a heart attack. Because a true panic attack feels like you're having a heart attack to some extent. Um, and people think that and they end up in emergency and then emergency says there's nothing wrong with your heart. And, just a panic attack and go see a psychologist. Um, the interesting thing is, is that once you've learned how to moderate, moderate your breathing and get your breathing under control, you can switch a panic attack off. Okay, or you can certainly reduce its impact. So there are really specific breathing techniques that you can teach people, and you can feel a panic attack coming on, and you can knock it off. Okay, before it's even come on. So if you know someone who's had panic attacks or who think that they are. Um, have a look around for some information. There's heaps of books as well if you're not comfortable seeing a site. There's self-help books that teach you breathing techniques or muscle relaxation, um, and they're all very useful to help and calm down your system. Okay. Um, agoraphobia, don't see this common, but it's every now and again, where someone's too afraid to even leave their house. Sometimes it can come from someone has a panic attack and then they fear that they'll have that panic attack in public again, so they stay at home and then they stay at home for such a period of time that then they fear actually going out. Um, social phobia, very common. Okay? Social phobia is, is connected to what, what, does, what do other people think about me and worrying consistently what other people are thinking about me okay? and feeling nervous responding or speaking or what if I mumble or what if I lose control or what if I do something silly or I don't want to be the centre of attention. There's a whole lot of things that go along with so, um, social phobia. Uh, specific phobias, well, you know there's a couple, okay? Public speaking is one. Uh, spiders, okay? I'm not friendly to spiders. That'd be my closest phobia. Yeah. Elevators, it's also different, you know, weird ones. Uh, cats, has anyone heard of any other phobias that people have that are interesting? Cats, animals, birds. Insects, like there's a whole variety of really interesting ones in trains. I counsel someone who's who just developed a very specific phobia almost overnight about trains. Okay. Um, okay. 
uh, generalised anxiety. So basically it's a whole range of worry about a whole range of different things. It's generalised, so it's not over one thing, it's lots over lots of different things. Uh, but it results in physical symptoms. So someone always, you know, like quite often or almost daily has stomach aches or headaches or some other muscle tension related thing um, or dryness in the mouth because just they're worried about lots of things. OCD doesn't happen a lot, it's a low prevalence disorder, but I see um, in the Muslim community again it's around religious themes. Um, and but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about um, cleanliness, germs, safety and security, you know, locking doors, etc. And PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which is really characterised by <coughs> someone has to either go through something um, physically traumatic that either results in near death or severe injury to themselves that was completely unexpected. Okay, or it was witnessed, like I saw someone go through near death, death or severe injury um, that freaked that freaks me out. So I can experience it just by watching someone um, experience something that's traumatic. So if I, um, um, when I was younger, I saw a little kid get like, hit by a car, um, I must have been quite resilient because it didn't affect me traumatically. Um, but for some people, if they didn't have enough um, psychological resources to cope with that, that it might, they might have repetitive nightmares or see that um, traumatic event replay over and over to the point that then you start to have physical symptoms, okay? Or you start being really weary around cars. Quite often people who have a car accident, um, if they don't have certain resources, um, they might experience some of these symptoms, which is emotional numbness. Um, Hyper arousal means like you're on alert, okay? Like something bad is going to happen at any point. Um, uh, recurrent thoughts or images, so like flashbacks um, or repetitive nightmares, okay? doesn't happen a lot and what they usually say is that if people who have trauma one third will actually be better off from the trauma they will learn something they'll take something meaningful away from that trauma and they'll actually grow as a person one third will remain unchanged about one third will be significantly affected by the trauma okay in the, in the, they'll result with some symptoms from seeing the trauma so keep that in mind try and be the top third okay so by fostering better resilience
I can't take that step. Okay? And that's a protective factor. Because if you feel like you're coming close to that step and you know that it is against your faith, that's also telling you you need assistance. Okay? If you're coming close to something that you know is essentially deemed un-Islamic, then that, you mean, that means go and get assistance if you feel like that. Okay? As opposed to sitting that step you know, until you're not functioning cognitively anymore and you're not making proper decisions anyway. And then some people do take that step. And I've been a little bit surprised to hear um, over the last few years, and not just in this um, university, but in other universities, that some Muslim students have taken their life. So we have to think about how you know, one life is too many. And, um, and I'm sure that there's many more that we are unaware of. And for my understanding, that the help is there, but it's about people like you who are coming to these events, which is almost unheard of. I must say, it's probably the first time in any university this lot of society has done this, so it's to be congratulated. Um, because it's not like depression or mental health issues have just popped up in all sorts, they've been there. But it's also about people like yourselves who are possibly studying and coming through the ranks, who go on to, to become psychologists or counsellors or advocates in these areas, and who just talk about it. Okay? Even now, you've got some knowledge, and if you went and told three friends what you learned today, you could be saving someone, or you could be helping someone to have better mental health just by sharing the message. What does it look like? Again, it looks familiar, but don't want to go out, don't want to talk to people, want to be by yourself. Um, cry, but you can't really think of a reason why, but it's just crying. Um, sleeping too long or can't fall asleep. Memory impairment, so there's some cognitive impairment, can't focus, etc. But what happens is it's not just, oh, I can't concentrate, you actually start seeing that it impacts on your academic performance. Okay? So you might think you're travelling okay, you're handing in assignments, but you're failing everything. Or you're getting really low marks, whereas you got really high marks for the previous semester. But there's a drop. Okay? Um, so some thoughts. Um, I can't be bothered with life, sort of giving up helplessness type attitude. My life is really awful, I can't stand it. Um, I don't enjoy things I like to, that I once liked to do. So there's a loss in, a drop in pleasure. So for me, it's eating chocolate, okay? But what if one day I woke up and I didn't want any chocolate or I couldn't stand chocolate, so I'm clear on, okay? Um, but there's a loss in pleasure. So something that you previously really liked doing but now you don't feel like, I can't be bothered. Replaying bad, bad images or bad experiences over and over in your head. Remember, this is a combination of thoughts, not just one isolated. Um, I'm stuck and I can't do anything about it. Okay. Sometimes we get like that. So uh, the experience of depression will sometimes make you just go, oh God, I have no idea how to solve this. And you feel like they're concreted into the ground. Okay. So getting some nasiha from someone or some different, some different thinking around your problem always helps to loosen that concrete and give you a bit more flexibility in your thinking. So which is good to, sometimes we can develop what's called habits of thought where we re replay stories in our head and they contribute to how we feel. Coping <laughs> mechanisms for for many Muslims, you see, this is holding senior members of family, the family. But that will become a problem because if you frame the problem as something that's really taboo or there's a lot of stigma around it, then you're unlikely to go to a family member. So think about that. If you're stuck because of, you know, you don't want to disappoint someone, um, or you feel like there's a certain amount of shame, and there is no such thing. You know, shame essentially, but we feel it. If there's a shame there, um, not that anyone's doing anything wrong, being unwell, but if there is, then find someone who you think is at your level, who who might hear your story okay, and help you. Um, and this is also where people come to you with stories. Okay? Sometimes one of the best things to do is to just admit that. Everyone has their own limit, even I do, as a professional, have my own limit in terms of how I'm able to help people. Okay? And the best thing that you can do, is, as the previous council mentioned, is literally take their hand, 
arm, shoulder, or whatever, and walk them to the counsellor. Okay. Um, I taught my daughter to do this, she's 14, and last year she came across one of her friends who was self-harming, and of course we have this discussion, she's like, one of my friends is self-harming, I'm not going to tell you who it is because it means more to secrecy, of course, she's 14, and I'm like, well, you know what to do, you need to take the counsellor, and, the, and my daughter's actually like, oh, they're going to do nothing. <laughs> um, so this 14 year old thinking, they're going to do nothing, and I said, it doesn't matter, I'll take her anyway. And so after lots of coaxing, 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 coaxing of her friend, saying, come on, you know, this is not, this is not good, you know, this is not good. And, you know, she eventually gets her to the school counsellor. Okay. Um, and and holds, her, holds her there and goes, you know, like, sit down, you have to speak to the school counsellor. You know what, that's being a good friend. Okay. And not just that, checking up on them. Okay, did you go to your counselling appointment? Okay, because just getting there once is not enough. That's, that's not going to do anything. Okay, it's going back. Okay, it's following us. So check in with them. Did you go back? Okay, I know people who have come to me and I go, why are you here? My friends made me. <laughs> they made me come. Okay. Or sometimes it's about family members. My mum, you know, like I've got a lot of teenagers. My mum thought there was something wrong. Even if that's adults, I have mums bringing in 19 year old guys <laughs> to my clinic going, something's wrong. Um, so that's one. So be a good friend and be positive and encouraging and think about and tell them what they're going to learn. Okay? What they're going to learn. Okay. Seeking spiritual support through prayer. Okay? Never underestimate the impact of prayer. And we know that this happens. Consulting imams or religious leaders and all texts and holy books, all useful. So the Quran is an entire book that changes your thinking on life, gives you perspective, gives you stories to put your life in perspective or to derive some learnings from. But it doesn't, there's nothing that says just use one of these. Use all of them. Use all of them. Any questions about that? Fasting, do you find that it changes people's attitudes in terms of if they have a panic attack? Does that help them? With fasting? With fasting. That's a good question. Because they're more harm? I actually haven't noticed it, but it'd be yeah, interesting hypothesis. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, um, I mean, you can tie. Breathing, I mean, the best thing about breathing to get a panic attack under control is I tie it to prayer. So I tell people to practice it at the times of prayer five times a day um, or as, as many times as they're praying. Um, so just to practice it before they have the panic attack. Okay. There's no point going on. Oh, what did that psychologist say? And you've lost your breath. Okay. So try, try and implement something. If you do it before prayer, then it actually makes your prayer more mindful. You pay more attention. If you've settled yourself, there's no point. You know, as we all know, running to prayer, you know, but your mind is still, you know, a kilometre behind you and not meant to be in front of you. So just doing a couple of, you know, deep breaths. Let's do it now. Okay. Okay. I'm going to teach you how to deep breathe. Okay. Just how to knock off a panic attack, which is just seven minutes. Okay. So sit up straight. You want to collapse your diaphragm. 